We're doing a series right now. And so does anybody remember the first one we did? I'm going to do you. If I follow the Spirit, I'll be fine. I mean, you know, there's lots of spirits. And the Spirit, Holy Ghost, always has to line up with the Word of God. And lots of people get in trouble because they don't check the Word. Amen. What was it? I want to reteach the whole thing or the whole series on. What's the next one? Follow your heart. Just follow your heart. How many people have heard that? Just follow your heart. How many learned that if you follow your heart, you're probably going to, there ain't no problem. You're going to get in trouble. How many know we should follow the Word of God? Amen. All right. Does anybody remember what we did? You can't judge me. Nobody's ever heard that or said that in here, I know. Or only God can judge me. That ought to scare you when it's so. So we found out that the Bible doesn't say that. You all can, your face says you're about as thrilled as you were the first time I said that all. <laughs> you're like, dear Lord. So we have a list. It says number the first one is you says you can't judge me. And then for those that don't know, I'm gonna go ahead and say. I made up books of the Bible in chapter and verse, and these don't exist, okay? So don't go looking for uh, the book of self righteous. <laughs> chapter 2, verse 3. You know, so you can't judge me, self righteous, chapter 2, verse 3. Then we did follow your heart. That's the path of destruction, chapter 1, verse 5. Do what makes you happy, stroke in the flesh, chapter 1, verse 1. We haven't done that one yet. God won't give you more than you can handle. Hezekiah chapter 2 verse 5. That usually gets a lot of people. Oh, Hezekiah, they really go looking for him. He is a king in the Bible. Uh, but uh, how many know if God won't give you more than he can handle, he wouldn't tell you to cast your cares upon him. He wouldn't tell you that in your weakness his strength is made perfect. He wouldn't tell you that his yoke is easy, his burden is light. And, I mean, God isn't always the only one giving you things. That was just free right there. <laughs> We're all God's children. Abraham 4, 2. How many's heard that? Well, we're all intended to be His children. Only those that are, are blood-bought are His actual kids. I hate to break it to you. If we were all his kids, then we wouldn't need a savior. Amen. God helps those who help themselves. Yeah. Everybody's probably heard that, and some of you has probably said it. That's night two, three. Just do it. God helps those who help themselves. If you could help yourself, would you need a savior? No. Now, what we. Listen, in all these here, please don't misquote me. I'm going to say, the, the, Satan is an angel of light. So he works in partial truths. There's partial truth in a lot of these, but how many know a partial truth is still a whole lie? And it's still deception. Okay? So, that's what he's doing here. Because how many know God, you know, if you just, that's kind of like if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat, Right? So some people could say, well, that's where God helps those who helps himself. The Bible says, you know, you enjoy the fruit of your labor, so I help myself. Yeah, well, who got you the job? Who made you able to do it? Who gave you the hands? Who gave you the wisdom to do those things? God doesn't have favorites. And I know you've heard me say a bunch, and that's the tolerance three five. You've heard me say, I'm God's favorite, and then I'll laugh and say everybody's God's favorite. He is. But you know what? There is people that do earn a little more favor. We see in the Bible, the Bible talks about those that are more blessed and highly favored. Those that were closer to Him. Those that were more obedient. Those that did things. And we see the three that was there. We see that Mary was blessed and highly favored. We, we just can see it all throughout the Bible that, you know what, God appreciates those that lead a life of sacrifice and obedience and put him, puts Him first. And it does gain you favor with the big guy. Okay? Now, does he have clicks? He does not. 
He's everybody's the same. Every kid's the same. No, but he's no respecter of persons. He's not favoring somebody else more than you. But you might get a if, if you know you line your life up more and more with him, you may get more of the blessings because you learn to line up more with the Word of God that puts you more in the favored side of it. Y'all see what I'm saying? All right. The next one, I'm going to get in trouble. And I know some of you in here have just lost some clothes, so I'm not trying to meddle. But uh, I'm going to tear up, tell a short story. I didn't intend to tell this, but I'm going to show why this one's so dangerous. Heaven must have needed another angel, comfort one one. People tell people that all the time. Well, they got... God needed an angel and he wouldn't have got to. Well, when we die, we don't become an angel. An angel doesn't have the same soul we have and someone cannot become an angel. Okay? Now they do go to heaven. And they do have a job up there. They are hanging out with Jesus. They're dancing. They're having a great time. Okay? We can tell them the truth. That's better than making something up. Right? Now, why is it dangerous to tell them they become an angel? Because there is fallen angels also upon this earth. Okay? And they're demons. And the Bible talks about familiar spirits. Anybody ever heard of a seance and things like that where people talk to the dead? Well, if they're in heaven, how many know they're not going to come down here and talk to some witch? But these familiar spirits, fallen angels that are following you around, that's why they're familiar. They're keeping an eye on you. They're learning all about you. And then they'll talk to that witch and tell all kinds of things and make you think that's your loved one and you're communing now with the demon who's looking to get control in your life and he's looking to destroy you. And there, someone saying, well, that's my angel. Well, they'll even act like one. And when you go seeking those things, you go opening up those doorways, it puts you in a deathly place. I've seen people say, well, they're talking to their loved ones. When you're not talking to your loved ones, you're actually talking to a familiar spirit. And that familiar spirit is meaning to do you harm. Does everybody see what I'm saying? Amen. The Bible says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The Bible says that, that we are now absent here, but present with the Lord. And we're not, they're not coming back until He comes back to get us. When He comes back to get us, they're going to be with Him. We're going to meet Him in the air. Those that's been saved and right with God, it's going to be a glorious time. And so there's lots of things to celebrate. We just got to have know the Bible and be taught enough to get to celebrate those things. So it's not that God didn't give us comfort or give us things to stand on. We just got to stand on the right things and make sure we're not opening ourselves up to the wrong things. Now, I'm not going to teach on all of them, but I'm just blasting down through a little bit today. Does everybody see what I'm saying? Does everybody see where that could be dangerous now? Okay. Am I trying to take away from your thing? No, I'm not. I'm just... So, money is the root of all evil. Indebted 5-7. Anybody heard that? Yeah. I'm just going to go ahead and break it down for you. Don't say that. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. There's nothing wrong with money. God needs money to make the kingdom work. Jesus even had a treasure, although he was a thief. But he had money in his ministry too, so take it up with him. It takes money to make a ministry work. And a lot of it. But the love of money is the root of all evil. I mean, oh, you should, it's kind of like, we, we should own things. Things shouldn't own us. There was a time when motorcycles owned me. How about that? There was a time when my Harley was, you know, if I had, you know, I would never be Pastor Tender. But years ago, the thing is, is now all that stuff is just a tool. God told me to give it away tomorrow. I would give it away and it wouldn't bother me a bit. Whatever I've got, that's what it would be. Because it doesn't own me. Y'all with me still? The eyes are the window to the soul. Now there's some scripture that people have perverted to say this, and you can see a lot by looking in someone's eyes, 
but there, there's a there's a prophetic part that's actually the discerning of the soul, and that's actually a spiritual gift, and not everybody has that, and that is where that actually came from. But when you go looking down deep people's eyes and you try to work it up, guess what? You're opening yourself up to another one of those familiar spirits that people get into that give charismatics and spirit filled folks a bad name. Big smile. Do you see what I'm saying? God wants you to be happy. False too far. Well, yeah, God wants me to be happy. God's more interested with me making heaven and me winning souls than me just being happy. He's going to tell it to you straight. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm going to break it down a little more because I got maybe I'll still teach on this one. Happiness is an emotion. Joy is a spiritual condition. Happiness is, a, is based on happenstances. Happenstances can change. Therefore, happy, your happiness changes. Nothing God does is based on happenstances. And if you base your life on happenstances, you're going to never truly be happy. But the joy of the Lord is something that's sure that you can have even whenever happenstances aren't good. Still with me? All things are possible for those who believe. Cinderella 8 9. Now I spent years teaching this right here, but people still, I always throw in that lines up with the Word of God. But how many you know anytime there's human beings, they can take things out of context? Mark chapter 11, verses 22 through 24 says, Whosoever can have whatsoever, they ask in faith and believe. But it goes on to say it lines up with the Word of God. It doesn't say that I can, I, I want a new Lamborghini and I'm going to stand in faith. What glory to God is that going to be, it be if God gets me a new Lamborghini or a new carpet or even a new house? How does that bring God glory? So, by telling people that, you set them up for all the wrong things because everything that we do should be based on bringing glory to God and accomplishing His mission upon the earth, which is to see souls saved and lives changed. Big smile. You see what I'm saying? All things are possible to them that believe that line up with the Word of God and His mission upon the earth. But if you take that out of context, you could get a messed up doctrine, couldn't you? Now, I believe that God wants you to prosper. He wants to make you a walking billboard of the goodness of God. But I don't believe that's His main thing. And I believe if that's all you're standing in faith for, you've got it all mixed up and you're probably going to have some hiccups along the way. Amen? Everything happens for a reason. Confusion 7 6. How many's heard that? You know, something's happened because you're stupid, something's happened because you make dumb choices. Something's happened because you sin. Something's happened because you're getting you're going through a trial and tribulation. But you know, there's only one person that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and that's Satan. John 10:10. 10, 10. But the, the next part of that says God says you, they tell you may have life and have it more abundantly, right? So if uh, someone steals your car and God works it out to your good so you can witness to the person, was it God's idea for them to steal your car? Was that God that made them steal your car? Well, God had him steal my car so that I could witness to that young man. No, Satan stole your blooming car and God still turned it around for good and still made something good out of it. Get the story straight. God didn't make that happen. Or maybe the Holy Spirit talked to you and said, hey, take the keys out. And you said, it's fine. <laughs> well, it will happen for a reason. Look, well, just because God, God's going to honor His Word. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to love God. They're called according to His purpose. If you're walking in the end of them, He's still going to make it work out for your good. That doesn't mean it was always His plan. We've got free will. Y'all still with me? When God closes a door, He opens a window. Happy thinking, 10-1. 
God, here's my plan. You've closed the door. I know you're going to open a window so I can just fly out of this mess. <laughs> Number one, whose plan is it? And if you're looking for a window, you've, you've not really sought God about His plan anyways, I can already tell you. I don't have to attend church to be a Christian. Lukewarm 10.9 we're going to look at a few of these verses this morning. This ain't my text, but we're going to use, we're going to look. Because I hear this all the time. We're, and some people know just enough scripture just to don't know how stupid they sound. I'm just going to, I got to be me and talk straight. Where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst of them. That's what he said, but he didn't say you were having church either. He just said he'll show up there where two or three are at. And nowhere did he say that was a church service. He just promised to show up when two or three gathered in his name. Right? right. right. Yes, Pastor. So, this is a famous verse. You go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 21. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 21. And having a high priest over the house of God. Who's our high priest? Jesus. Jesus. So he's our high priest. He's the one telling us what to do here. This is his idea. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Okay, we've got to get our hearts together and just show up any willy way. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, we washed in the blood of the Lamb, we got rid of our stuff, we got our minds straight. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. Don't give in to the doubts of the enemy. Once you've made your mind up to serve God, you've made your mind up on those things, doubts are going to come. That's why He put that in there. But you've got to set your face like Clint. I believe in the Word no matter what. Got it? Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and the good works. I have found, you know, it's hard to find somebody that enjoys a good provoking these days. <laughs> People don't enjoy it when you provoke them. You know, some, sometimes people say a lot of things, they say a lot of things to me as pastor. And sometimes the Lord just says, I, He lets me just let it go and I pray for Him. And then there comes a time when it's life and death and he says, you need to say something. I'm like, great. You know they're not going to receive that when I provoke them. He's like, but if you love them, you're going to provoke them. <laughs> provoke them means they're going to move them to do something that they didn't want to do. In case you didn't know what that meant. It's not the popular huggy, huggy, kissy, kissy thing, you know. <laughs> oh, I miss you today. Yeah, I missed you too, but golf was great, Pastor. <laughs> that reminds me of the pastor that skipped church. <laughs> he went out and he was playing golf. He had the best golf game of his life. He got a hole in one. And one of the angels looked at God and he said, why are you letting him do this? Why are you letting him get by with us? He said, Jesus looked at that angel and smiled. He said, yeah, but who's he going to tell? <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. So we got to provoke one another on to love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That assembling there, when you break that down, means a large people group. I know we're not exceptionally large today, but I mean, we have an assembly hall here where we can hold a large group of people and that's what a church is and that's what he's talking about. And he says, don't forsake it. He says, especially as you see the day growing closer, he says, you're going to need this house of God more and more. And the enemy's going to do all he can to get you out of here. And only you can decide. And sometimes I may have to provoke you. But guess what? It's also your job to provoke one another. And so, as a matter of some, it is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. He didn't just say pastor, did he? 
He said, you guys uh, uh, exhorting each other. Hey, come on, man. I missed you Sunday. Man, don't be doing that. You know you you, you got all week. God, God gets two hours out of the week, and you got all the other time in the world. Don't give me that that you, it's the only time you can do it. I'm shooting straight, but you know, the Bible says I don't have to. Everybody today, that's what they do. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, if you don't go to church, you're not really a Christian. He said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Is this an option? Is he asking you? Did he say, when you feel like it, don't forsake the assembly? Come on, I'm not trying to be hard. I'm trying to get you free. Come on, do you see what I'm saying? Is he asking your opinion here? No. On certain days when you feel like it, would you come to the house of God? No. Whenever it be due to you. <laughs> no, he says, forsaking, not forsaking sinners so together is matter is so uh, exhorting our so much you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, so now he's just telling you straight in case you're missing it, that not coming to church is willfully sinning. If we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There are no more sacrifice for sins. So you someone say, well, he's talking about a different thing. Well, what would he just spent four verses on talking about? Not forsaking the assembling yourselves together as you seem to day growing closer. Come on, I'm not trying to twist it up, right? I can show you a bunch of other places, but let's just go to another verse real fast. It ties right into this one. We'll just tie it in real fast. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew 6, 33. Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God is where? Inside us. Christ is living in us. When we come in together, we're like a... When you come together with an assembly, if I have a battery, one cell can't do much. But the Bible says two or three can put 10,000 flight. Because the more battery cells you get together, the more power you got. That's the same way it is with the body of Christ. Still with me? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we got a but, two ands. So we have conditions. But seek ye first. So if you do this, then I'll do this. It's conditional. Can I make you seek? No. I can make you thirsty, hopefully. Make you hungry. But only you can decide if you're going to seek first the kingdom of God. You know, there's churches full all across America where there's very few people seeking God. I've just decided I'm going to be one of them. I mean, God was ministering this morning. Let's not forget that, right? That's how you got ministered to. You came here expecting to meet God, yet you're expector connected to your believer. And guess what? You got met. Praise God. Why? Because you didn't forsake this suddenly yourself together. I promise you the devil gave you five million reasons why not to come to church today. And half of us probably he's mad at me, and that's okay. <laughs> if not, just wait. It'll come in a few weeks. I got big shoulders. I can take it. But I've had a lot the last few weeks. Give me a little bit to bounce back. But so that one, how many know that if you if you fall into that, you really are lukewarm? And then the Bible says he'll spit you out of his mouth. And the thing is, is you're in a dangerous place. You're in a place of you're at a point of dying and you don't even realize it. Do you see what I mean? Does someone that's about on the way out, do they need me to start yelling at them always? No, they leave me revoked and I say, you know what, you're you you are going to die, you know. There comes a point in time that I got to say, if you continue on that way, it, you're not going. Well, I can go wherever I want to go. You can, but it's not really, you know. 
Work out for the God places you in church families. You don't get to choose it like a car dealership. Amen. Did you choose your earthly family? Yeah. Don't you have crazy uncles that drive you nuts? <laughs> you don't think the body of Christ is any different? <laughs> Come on, I'm preaching this morning. Because no, if you I've said this a million times and I joke about it, but it got me free once a long time ago, and that's why I share it. If you find a perfect church, you better get out of there because you're about to mess it up. Because there is no such thing as a perfect church. There's just a church that God's called you to. You know how He's called you to it? Because He gives you grace to put up with all the craziness of that church. Do you see what I'm saying? Alright, so let's move on. We've done that one. Look, i got 15 minutes left to do all these. And I got one more to do that's not even on here that we're going to do today. Oh, yay! <laughs> I can have anything if I believe. Manifestation 101, verse 2. No, you can't have anything. You have to line up with the Word of God and God's perfect will. And there's a difference between His perfect will and His permissive will. And it's got to be about Him and not about you. You need to always ask yourself, who's getting the glory? Me or God? And I already did this one as long as I follow my spirit, I'll be fine. Judah 24 9. So, now we're going to do one that wasn't on there real fast this morning. Y'all think I can do it in 15 minutes? I want to talk about this one. We put up the only one slide only. Yeah. Only good people go to heaven. Anybody ever heard that? Yes. Anybody ever thought that? Anybody like me that ever kept you from even trying to go to heaven because you knew you weren't ever going to be good enough? Yeah. So... I got up there, only good people go to heaven. That's in the book of works, chapter 1, verse 2. <laughs> if works got you into heaven, there's a lot of good people that would go. But you know, works is something on the outside. What does God judge anyways? The heart. The heart. So, but that is false. Only forgiven people go to heaven. And so we're going to look at a couple of verses here. 1 John chapter 1 verses 5 through 10. Maybe I no, I want to start at the other end. Luke 23 39-42 And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Doest not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our sins. But this man hath doeth nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest unto thy kingdom. And Jesus looked and said unto him, Thou be with me today in paradise. So, did this thief he was a thief. He wasn't a good man, was he? I mean, he was no good. And up to no good and hanging on the cross. He didn't have time to do any good works at all. But, he asked Jesus to forgive him, asked who he was, and Jesus forgave him right there and he got to go straight into heaven. And if that thief can get cleaned up and make it into heaven, I mean, oh, we can too. He was, that was not a good person that made heaven. That was a forgiven person that made heaven. Now, I've taught on this in depth and I teach on others. There's a difference between being, how many know the woman at the well? She was caught. She'd been, she was a prostitute. She'd slept with a whole bunch of guys. Jesus didn't beat her up. She couldn't even come at the same time as everybody else. 
she had to come at a different time or they wouldn't even have, they wouldn't even get water with her. And Jesus said, go and sin no more. He didn't say, come back next week and I'll forgive you again for sleeping around. Do you see what I'm saying? We have, after we're forgiven, we have the obligation to start doing our best to hit the mark. Do we always get it right? No. But you know when you miss it, and we're going to get that at the end of this, you ask for forgiveness and you straighten your anger. Okay? But there are, the point is, is that unfortunately there's some, and I thought I'd do one on the other so on the other side. There's a lot of religious folk. They may not come out and say it, but they allude to that only good people go to heaven. And you've got to jump through all these hoops. No, only forgiven people do. But we knew we do. Our works do matter. It shows that we have faith. Okay? But it isn't our works that get us to heaven. It's His, his blood. Because none of us would ever be good enough to go. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Faith in who Christ is. Faith in what He did on the cross. But reaching into the unseen realm, getting the same, and not of yourselves. Listen, your works do matter. There's a whole message on sanctification. There's a whole message. If you don't know what that big fancy word is, I'll teach you. We do basic Bible doctrine. You need to come take the class. There's nothing you can do to be good enough to get saved. It's simply by accepting His forgiveness and then you start walking it out and accepting that you have changed. He said it is the gift of God. And that's what it is. It's a gift. You can't earn it. He just pops it and says, here it is. I did it just for you. When He was on the cross going through that, He had me and you on His mind. Tears me up every time I think of it. And then it goes on to say pretty plainly, what's that say? Not of what? Works. works. Now works matter after you're saved, but to get saved, they have no bearing. Everybody tells you we well, gotta do this, you gotta do that, you know, Hail Mary's, you gotta go work here in the soup kitchen, you gotta all those are great things we should do, but you can never be good enough to get saved. It's a gift. Everybody's just as dirty as the next feller when they come to the cross. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Wait a minute, there's good works. Now we're talking about works. Yeah, now that we're made in his image, we're reborn into Christ. Now maybe we can do something worthwhile with our lives. Amen. Now maybe we can start doing some good works. I couldn't do nothing good before. I was always getting my stink on it. Which God hath, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, moving on. Romans chapter three, Romans three twenty through twenty five. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the rights of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law of prophets, and even the rights of God, which is by faith of Christ Jesus unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For just those dirty heathen hillbillies have sinned. What does it say? For all have sinned. That's everybody, right? And come short of the glory of God. No matter how hard you work, no matter how good you are, we are we're all that's where we all start at, at the foot of the cross. We've all sinned. We've all came short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. His grace there is free. His redemption is free. And then soon God has set forth to be appropriation. I always butcher that word. It's like writing a big fat check and a, a deed for all the property for all your life and pays all the bills of every sin and everything you've ever done and are ever going to do as long as you choose to stay connected to Christ. Through faith in His what? Blood. He, we never have to have it applied again. It's one time and it's good. It's good. Now, I don't believe in once saved, always saved, but I do believe we, we can fall away from Christ 
Hebrews 6, 6 talks about that, but it's not an overnight thing. It's a slow death by a thousand cuts and dumb choices that eventually gets us to fall away. That we can get back underneath there, but the point is always to come back to Christ and turn around and start serving Him. Okay, there you go. To declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So the whole point is get saved, live for God. Got it? Okay. Mark 10, 18 through 21. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? This is Jesus, the Son of the living God. He's getting on them because they were calling him good. He said, Why are you calling me good? There is none good. He's like, I'm not even good. So when the devil comes knocking on you and you're doing your level best, just remember, God, Jesus wasn't good either. Come on, some of you need to hear this today. He said, That is God, only one. So thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto them, Master, all these I observed for my youth. This guy was pretty good, man. And he was that's a pretty good guy, ain't he? And he's he was doing some good stuff. And then Jesus the old and him loved him like you doing good. You are he just said, nobody's good. But this guy's doing pretty good. He's like, yeah. And he said to him, one thing that thou lackest, go thy way and sell whatsoever thou hast. Remember that love of money thing? Mm -hmm. And give to the poor. Now shall have treasure in heaven and come take up thy cross and follow me. And the guy couldn't do it. So there's none good. Only God. Someone starts talking about, are you good enough to be a Christian? Say, nope, nobody is. Let me introduce you to my Jesus. He'll fix you right where you're at. We start you out, and then, well, then we can talk about being being better than what you were before. <clears throat> First John chapter one, verse five through ten. This then is the message which we have heard of Him declared unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in light as He is in light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son. Cleanse us, cleanse us from only all the big sins. From what? All sin. All sin. Come on, some of you need to get excited about that. All sin. For if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So here's the key. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Next time the devil tells you that's too big for God, you screwed up too much, I want you to memorize this verse that says all unrighteousness. That covers everything. If you confess it and believe it and turn from it, it's covered. You're free. That's good news! Yay! If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. Don't be a religious hypocrite. So do only good people go to heaven? No. no. <laughs> False. The Bible does not say that. What a great game show we should have. Some of you may have known this, but I do believe that some of you got some freedom in some different ways today.